Hi, my name's Andy and I work for the Pace Trust that does assemblies, RE lessons and lunchtime clubs in Paul, Bournemouth and Christchurch. Many years ago, England, well in fact the whole empire, had a queen called Queen Victoria and she had a famous phrase which was, we are not amused. And I don't know if you've ever been given what I call the look. When you're doing something and somebody does this to you, or this, or that. I can't really do it very well, but there are some people who can manage the look brilliantly. It's that look that says, we're not amused, we don't approve, you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And I realised something, probably a bit too late really, as I was an adult, but someone once said, you can't please all the people all of the time because you're not a pizza. You can't please everybody all the time. Sometimes you've got to make a stand and it will be unpopular. JK Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, her um, character Dumbledore said this, we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. One of my great heroes, a guy called Martin Luther King said this, it's one of my favorite t-shirts. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Jesus was somebody that said the right thing, not the easy thing. He got into trouble. He was brave and courageous, even though it got him into a lot of trouble, even though actually in the end, it cost him his life. So let's have a little look at Jesus getting into, into trouble. In fact, it probably started when Jesus was a baby. When Jesus was a baby, the first visitors he had were shepherds. And if you're a posh religious person, you'd say, those shepherds are a little bit smelly. They're not very cool. People used to make jokes about shepherds. And then later, the wise men who came, if you were a good, upstanding Jewish person, astronomers from another country would have been a big no-no. Again, you wouldn't have approved. And then when Jesus was still a baby, his mum and his dad took him to the temple and he met this really old priest and a really old lady called Simeon and Anna. And Simeon said of the baby, this child is going to be a light to the whole world, a light to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. In other words, this child's going to bring blessing to everybody. And then he said this, but it'll also be a sign that many people will speak against. Even now, you say the word Jesus, and that people have very different reactions. Some people are like, yeah, Jesus is amazing, and other people get a bit funny when you say the word Jesus. Anyway, Jesus grew up, and he picked some disciples to come and journey with him. But he didn't pick the brightest, the best, the coolest, the cleverest. He picked fishermen that probably smelt a little bit probably smelt a fish, and tax collectors who people just didn't like. You can imagine the religious people and people just looking at his choice and just having a bit of a laugh. And then Jesus set about his ministry, and that got him into trouble too. He healed people on their special day when you weren't supposed to do any work. He made a lady with a bad back straighten up. A man with a withered hand, he made it better. A guy who couldn't walk, he enabled him to walk. He did that on a Saturday, the Sabbath, and that got him into trouble. He hung out with people that the religious folk said, you shouldn't be hanging around with them. He talked to tax collectors. They didn't like those. He talked to Samaritans, and in those days, Jews and Samaritans didn't get on. It's a bit like Manchester United and Man City fans don't get on, do they? Or, or Liverpool and Everton fans don't get on. These guys, the Jews and the Samaritans, didn't like each other at the time. And Jesus made a Samaritan woman's little girl better. And he talked about a good Samaritan being the one who actually helped someone in trouble when the religious people just walked straight past. He even made a servant of a Roman soldier better. Time and time again, Jesus did those things that got him into trouble and made him unpopular. 
He also broke a few of the religious rules. He, his disciples ate with mucky hands. And on one occasion, a guy with leprosy touched him. In fact, he touched the guy with leprosy. And a woman who was bleeding touched the hem of his clothes. And he raised a guy called Lazarus, who was dead. He brought him back to life. And he got people very angry. So there were all these guys who were angry and cross with Jesus. And he told them this story. We've looked at a little bit of it before, but I want to tell you it from another person's perspective. We looked at the story we called the lost son, or in our case we did it last time, the lost daughter. And we got, imagine the older sibling, the older sister. She sees her younger sister going off, spending all her dad's money. She asks for half of his inheritance, spending it all blowing it all, going away, not keeping in touch. And she was going, yeah, I'm the good one. I'm staying at home. They'll be really pleased with me. And then it all suddenly goes wrong. After a long gap of just her and her dad, this sister returns, penniless, having lived in a pigsty. And her dad welcomes her home, welcomes her back to part of the family and throws a party while the older sister is furious. She's saying, all these years, I've been so good. Where's my party? And the dad says to her, you've always been with me. And everything I have is yours. But she was gone. She was like, she was, she was lost. She was almost like she was dead. And now she's returned. Surely we should celebrate. In other words, the dad was saying, we'd have done this for you. I think it's the older one that's actually more lost than the younger one. She didn't go anywhere, but didn't know just how much she was loved. So as we come in to finish now, just thinking a little bit about a word we want to explore a bit later on in another assembly called grace. Actually, we mess up. None of us are perfect, but each one of us is loved. And I want to say this today. Maybe you feel a bit like an outcast. Maybe you feel like you don't really matter. Well, I want to say that God loves you. As a Christian, I believe that God loves you, that you are precious to God. And as a Christian, I also want to say that nobody is too far from God's friendship and love. And maybe if you think you're a bit better than everybody else, maybe just challenge you to think, actually, I get it wrong and I need God's help. And I know, need to know just how much God loves me. And should we just close with a prayer? Dear God, I thank you that you love everybody. You created everybody to be your friends. You created everybody in your image. I think everybody is precious in your sight. No matter what they do, no matter where they're from, no matter how much they mess up, everybody is important to you. Help us to know that we're important to you. And help us to know that other people are important to you too, and help us to live that out. Amen. Hi, my name's Andy, and I work for the Pace Trust, and we do assemblies in Paul, Bournemouth, and Christchurch. We're going to think a little bit about a really old story that's not from the Bible, but written by a guy called Victor Hugo. It's been a musical, it's been a film, it's even been a TV series. It features a guy called Jean Valjean, whose life's just been really tough, and he's had a tough and hard time. He's been in prison for a long time. He's angry at the world. Everything has gone wrong for him. And then one day, he bangs on the door of a bishop who welcomes him in and gives him a bed for the night, looks after him, is really kind to him. And in the night, Jean Valjean wakes up and does something really bad. He grabs a whole load of silver and puts it in his bag and runs off. The next day, um, a couple of soldiers bring Jean Valjean back to the bishop having caught him with a whole load of, a whole load of silver. And the bishop does something incredible. He gets two candlesticks, silver candlesticks, and says, you left so early, these two things you should have taken as well, and gives Jean Valjean two silver candlesticks and lets him go. But before he goes, he says, remember what I've done and let this change your life. 
And I was thinking about that. I was thinking three things. First of all, I thought if the bishop had said, he's nicked my stuff, send him back to prison, that would have been justice. If he said, he nicked my stuff, he stole my things, but I'm not pressing charges, let him go free, that would have been mercy. But what the bishop did was he gave Valjean what he did not deserve and what he had not earned. And that is what Christians call grace. What we have no right to, we didn't earn it, we don't deserve it, but yet we get it free anyway. Grace is a gift from God that's absolutely free. But when we say free, it actually cost a lot. We as Christians believe that Jesus died and rose again. That gives us this amazing gift. Some people say grace could stand for God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And this word grace is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Um, in fact, somebody, a guy who used to trade slaves called John Newton, wrote a famous hymn called Amazing Grace, when he realised just how amazing this central part of the Christian faith is. In Oxford University, where lots of brainy people used to hang about, they were chatting about what makes Christianity different from all other world religions. And they were getting a little bit stuck. And this guy called C.S. Lewis walked in the room, and C.S. Lewis um, wrote the Narnia books, and they said, Mr. Lewis, or Professor Lewis, what makes Christianity different from all other religions? And to which he replied, ah, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. So what is grace? I just want for a minute to tell you the whole story of Christianity in about two minutes. It starts off with a God who created everything, the sun, the moon, the stars. He created the world and he created me and you, human beings, to be in relationship, a friendship with him. And he gave us this other gift called free will, that we could choose to be his friend or not. And people chose to wander away from God and break that relationship. Now, over the time, people thought, actually, we want to restore that relationship. And they tried being really good but that didn't, didn't work. They tried being really religious and that didn't work. They tried all sorts of things. But God, who was the wounded party, the one who hadn't done anything wrong, came to mend that relationship and sent Jesus to stand in the gap. And Christians believe that when Jesus died on the cross, it's so he held out one hand to God and the other hand to people. So if people wanted to, they could be joined back to God. We'd all messed up. Jesus came and took the rubbish away to restore that broken relationship. It's a bit like this. We were created for relationship. The wrong things we did got in the way. And Jesus came, took them, died on the cross, dealt with them. So now that we can be joined back to God. But grace changes us. We don't earn it but it changes how we treat other people. Jesus told a story of a guy who had a huge debt. He owed lots of money to this king. And this king said, I'm gonna forgive you your debts. Your debts have been wiped away. And the guy was like, Whew. he was so relieved. And he walked out of the palace, skipping and jumping and dancing. And then he bumped into a friend of his who owed him a few quid. And he pinned his friend to the wall and said, pay me up all my money or you'll be in big, big trouble. And the king spoke to him later and said, why couldn't you have done for him what I did for you? Grace, what we didn't deserve, what we couldn't have earned, means that we should also treat other people with that same generosity and kindness. So what is grace? God's riches are at Christ's expense, unearned goodness that changes us, that restores that relationship with God, that means that we can be friends again with God, that means that we can be with God forever in heaven. Grace, all those great things we didn't deserve, but God offers to us anyway. I remember when I was a vicar, um, 
we had a, um, a little illustration. We, I, I stood up on a chair and I had a big chocolate bar in my hand and I got the kids to try and reach it and they couldn't reach it. And then I stepped down and handed it to them saying, it's not about reaching up for God. That's what other religions talk about, reaching up to God by what you do. Christianity is about God who reaches down to us. Should we close with a, with a prayer? Dear God, we thank you that even though we didn't earn it, even though we could never deserve it, thank you that you are kind, you are good, you are generous, and you give us what we do not deserve. Friendship with you, forgiveness, and a future forever with you. So thank you that even though we didn't deserve it, you're so good, and help us in our lives to be people that are gracious and full of grace to one another. We ask this in your name. Amen.